Welcome to the 2018-2019 AV Safety Seminar Series. This seminar we've entitled Enhancing Pilot Skills in a Dynamic Environment. The reason why we've used the word dynamic is because when we go flying, things rarely stay the same for very long. Things are constantly changing. And as a result, our human factors needs to keep up with the operation that we're undertaking. So today, in our presentation, the information that we're going to give you is applicable to you no matter what you fly. You could be flying an RPT turboprop, you could be flying an IFR twin, you could be into sport aviation like gliding or parachuting. It doesn't matter what you fly. The human factors concepts that we're going to explore today are applicable all the way across the board. There's three things that we're going to look at in our presentation today. The first is communication. Why communication? Well, because the way we communicate when we're in the air has significant challenges, significant challenges for us to overcome. And the way we communicate in the air is often very different to the way we communicate when we're on the ground, just chatting to people face to face. The second thing we're going to look at is situational awareness. Now, situational awareness by itself is a huge, huge area of study. People go to university for many years and, and study all the ins and outs of situational awareness. First of all, what it is, and secondly, to perhaps identify some of the red flags that you might be able to recognise in your own flying that might be clues to the fact that you might be losing situational awareness. And the third thing that we're going to look at today is a concept called threat and error management. Threat and error management has been around in the aviation industry now for a couple of decades, and it's becoming more and more important in the way we go flying. So let's have a look at communication. As I said at the outset, the way we communicate in the air is often significantly different and has a host of different challenges to the way we normally communicate when we're on the ground. And ATSB research bears out the fact that communication is an important factor when we go flying. Non-towered aerodromes, which is the focus of our presentation today, they're a central component of the Australian airspace system. And when we go through the ATSB accident database, they've identified issues to do with communication, situational awareness and threat and error management as being contributing factors to a whole host of different incidents and accidents in this realm. The ATSB research also indicates that problems with communication and situational awareness in particular do lead or do have the potential to lead to accidents. Not only uh, insufficient communication, but also communication that is inaccurate or even too much communication in the circuit area where the CTAF frequency gets certainly very busy. And that in itself presents us with challenges to maintain the safety of flight. Let's perhaps start with a bit of a case study. This case study was an incident that occurred at Port Macquarie Airport. This incident occurred about 12 years ago, back in 2007. Port Macquarie, of course, is a regional aerodrome on the mid-north coast of New South Wales. It's a reasonably busy airport, has a large flying school, and it also has an RPT service that comes up from Sydney. There are two runways, a sealed runway and a small cross strip. And as you can see from the photograph, the, the suburbs of Port Macquarie are now starting to encroach in, into the boundaries of this airport. We have nothing against Port Macquarie, but this, is, this example is a classic case of where breakdowns in communication have the potential for serious safety implications. So let's set the scene with regards to the four players or the four actors, if you like, in our scenario. Now we've identified these four aircraft in the vicinity of Port Macquarie Airport. These aircraft aren't exactly where they might be depicted in the picture, but they at least give you a relative uh, direction from the airport to help build our mental picture. So let's start the process. The first aircraft that we're going to look at is a Dash 8. The Dash 8, as you know, as many people know, is a twin turboprop uh, commuter aircraft. This Dash 8 was doing a regular public transport flight. It was coming inbound from the south from Sydney, inbound to Port Macquarie. This Dash 8 was an IFR aircraft, and it was inbound for a runway 03, which is the sealed runway there at Port Macquarie. The second actor in our scenario is a Beechcraft Baron. This aircraft was a twin engine machine, often used for personal transport, but in this instance, it was an IFR training exercise. This aircraft 
was inbound from the southwest and they were performing a GNSS approach onto runway 03. The Baron and also the Dash 8, they were both IFR aircraft. So the chances are that they knew of each other's existence. They would have been given traffic on each other by Melbourne Centre and they certainly would have been chatting to each other on the Port Macquarie CTAF frequency. Let's have a look at the third aircraft in our scenario. The third aircraft in our scenario was a Cessna 152. They were also using runway 03 and they were departing to the north on a navigation exercise. So now we come to the final actor in our scenario. The final piece of the puzzle was an RA Oz Foxbat aircraft and they were taxing for circuits on runway 21. Now that's the first perhaps little chink in the armour that we can see here. We have three aircraft that have nominated and are using runway 03, but unfortunately our fourth aircraft, for reasons which we'll discuss later in the presentation, has decided to use runway 21. So let's keep building the scenario and building that mental picture as we go. The Cessna 152 broadcasts its departure call as it leaves runway 03, but unfortunately is over-transmitted by the Foxbat. Over-transmission, which essentially means that there are two radio calls in at once from different stations, has a potential to be an instant breakdown in situational awareness and presents enormous problems for communication. Calls can't be understood calls can't be deciphered or heard properly when there's two stations over transmitting each other. Instant loss of situational awareness. Upon hearing this over transmission, the Dash 8 pilots, what they do is they jump on the CTAF frequency and they ask for a repeat of both of these broadcasts from the pilots. But in actual fact, it's only the Cessna 152 that repeats its broadcast. There's no repeat broadcast from the Foxbat. The Dash 8 is overflying for runway 03, but lo and behold sees the Foxbat actually rolling for takeoff head to head on runway 21. As you can see, this has enormous safety, imp safety implications. The first thing that the, the Dash 8 does is jump on the CTAF frequency and advise the Beechcraft Baron that they are head to head with an aircraft taking off towards them. The Baron upon hearing this does a very wise thing and exits stage left and conducts a go round from short final. It resolves this conflict by getting out of the immediate area. But we still have the situation whereby we have a Dash 8 in the vicinity of the circuit for 03 with unfortunately a Foxbat coming straight at them. The scenario develops even further and we find that the Foxbat actually takes off on runway 21. As you can see, a very dangerous or the potential for a, uh, a, an air proximity event is rapidly occurring. So what the Dash 8 has to do is modify their circuit entry to maintain separation with the Foxbat. Please be aware that uh, Dash 8 aircraft and larger turboprop aircraft, the larger aircraft and faster aircraft, they usually give their first inbound call at about 30 miles from the airport as they come down through about 10,000 feet. They're moving down the slope at about four miles a minute. So they'll be in the circuit area in about seven minutes or so from about 30 miles. The workload in the cockpit of the Dash 8 is usually quite high and the visibility outside the cockpit is often quite poor. So the last thing they want to be doing, if at all possible, is doing manoeuvring in the circuit, which involves often significant angles of bank, changes of power, changes of configuration. So at the last minute, as you can see from our diagram, the Dash 8 has to modify its circuit entry to maintain separation with the Foxbat. But as you'll see from the next slide that I'm going to put up, things don't resolve themselves immediately. What happens is that further in the circuit, the Dash 8 has to do a go around when the Foxbat cuts in front of that Dash 8 on short final. This is not a good state of events. Now this Dash 8 might have anywhere between 50 and 70 people on board and we're flying around and overhead the suburbs of Port Macquarie. Not a good state of affairs. The go round actually by the Dash 8 when the Foxbat pilot was interviewed after this event was in fact the very first time that that Foxbat pilot became aware that there was any other aircraft in the circuit. Now certainly we're not here to lay blame or to pass judgment on the Foxbat pilot because here but for the grace of God go you and I. We've all made mistakes in these types of environments. But as you can see from the scenario that we've described, 
breakdowns in communication can have serious ramifications in the air safety space. So what happened then? The Foxbat then made a probably a good decision and actually departed the circuit to troubleshoot what they thought was a radio problem. This was a good decision by the Foxbat pilot because it got the Foxbat away from other aircraft. Many pilots have had to troubleshoot issues when they're in the air. These issues might be problems with electrics, problems with the flap, engine problems. Two pieces of advice that I often provide when I run this seminar to pilots, if they do have a problem when they're airborne, many of us have had this, is to perhaps think about doing two things if we do have a problem in the air. The first thing is to get away from other aircraft and the second thing is to get away from the ground. The last thing we want to be doing is trying to troubleshoot an issue with our aircraft while we're mixing it in the circuit in close proximity to other aircraft. So the Foxpat pilot went away from the airport, tried to troubleshoot their problem. So what happened? The pilot couldn't determine the problem with their radio while they were airborne, but upon landing back again at Port Macquarie and shutting down, another pilot found that the entire issue had a causal factor, which was basically that the pilot had neglected to turn the volume up on their radio. It's quite telling, isn't it, that something as small as forgetting to turn the volume up can have potentially serious ramifications for aviation safety. And it was only due to the fact that communication was hindered because volume wasn't turned up. Again, no one's immune to this. I'm sure many of us have been flying where we've either had the volume turned up or we've been on the wrong frequency. But what this does show us is that if we have a breakdown in communication or the ability to communicate over the radio is somewhat hindered, the ramifications for safety further down the track can potentially be massive. The pilot was aware that Port Macquarie had what we call an aerodrome frequency response unit or an AFRU. Essentially, this is a small piece of kit that confirms to the pilot in command that their radio is on the correct frequency. If there's been no communication on that CTAF in the last five minutes, the pilot will hear back in their headset an automatic voice, in this instance saying Port Macquarie CTAF. It provides the pilot with confirmation that their radio is on the right frequency and the volume is appropriate. If there's been no transmission on the CTAF within the last five minutes, they'll just get a short tone in their headset. Now in discussions with the Foxpat pilot subsequent to this event, it turned out that the Foxbat pilot, as they were taxiing, saw or noticed a helicopter depart about five minutes before. So it could reasonably be concluded that the Foxbat pilot came to the decision that that helicopter was the only other aircraft that they had to worry about. Of course, that doesn't preclude pilots from looking out and using alerted see and avoid, but we'll discuss some of that later. The Foxbat pilot's intention, therefore, was to gain all their traffic information just from radio calls from other aircraft. We take away the radio call or the ability to make a radio call with the volume turned down and all of a sudden we're essentially flying in a deaf environment where we can't hear what's going on. All the other aircraft have, however, they were quite successfully using the Port Macquarie CTAF frequency to arrange their own mutual separation and that's what the CTAF frequency is for. We've spoken about communication in the aviation environment. It begs the question, doesn't it? How do we as, as human beings communicate in the non-aviation environment? Now, there's been many studies at universities around the world in the human factors associated with communication. What studies do show is that the vast majority of the way we communicate as people is in the non-verbal space rather than the verbal space. In fact, some studies show up to 93% of our communication as humans occurs in a non-verbal way. First of all, there's the acoustic way we communicate, not only just with our voice, but even the tone of our voice or even using expression in our voice. Things like the uh, appropriate use of pauses, okay, or even sounds. Another big way we communicate is by optical or visual means. In the Aviation Safety Advisor role, we see thousands of pilots all over Australia every year in hundreds of seminars. And one of the biggest ways we can communicate or the audience communicates to us is through essentially body language. We can tell a lot about how people are feeling or what their, their mood is just by body language how they hold their arms, how they hold their face, even things like facial expressions, even things like 
the, the clothes that people are wearing. I was at an airport once, I remember two pilots getting out of an aircraft at the fuel bowser. These pilots had wrinkled shirts on, food stains, their shirts were untucked, their shoes weren't polished. These pilots looked disgusting. I therefore came, rightly or wrongly, to the conclusion that these pilots were unsafe because I've also seen pilots at airports that have had nice uniforms that have been ironed, um, their, their, their shoes are polished, they're wearing a tie. Instantly I come to the conclusion that these pilots are somehow safe. That might be a wrong or a right conclusion, I'm not sure, but that's how people do communicate, even by the clothes we wear. If I go out uh, in, into a, a, an outback cattle station to talk to mustering pilots, I'm not going to wear a suit and tie. I'm going to wear something appropriate. We communicate a lot, even just with the clothes that we wear. The other way we also communicate is in a tactile sense. Putting your arm around someone or putting a hand on the shoulder. Again, it's a non-verbal way of communicating to other individuals. And finally, we can communicate with what the scientists call the olfactory sense, which is things like smells or odors. And people think often when I mention this, really, is that true? But think about the, the global perfume and, and aftershave industry. It's worth billions of dollars. Why? Because that's a way people can communicate. So there's heaps and heaps of different ways that we can communicate in a non-verbal sense. How does this relate to aviation? Well, when we're in the cockpit, we don't get the value or we don't get the benefit of non-verbal communication. All we are is a voice on the end of a CTAF frequency, for example, appearing through someone's headset. And potentially, that can be as little as 10% of the way that humans communicate. So when we go flying, we are in an environment that is very, very challenging for effective communication. And that's why our communication has to be spot on and we have to continually work at it to be effective. Because effective communication gives us the greatest chance of staying alive out there when we go flying around the CTAF environment. So, communication in the aviation environment. Here's an old adage that people have been saying for ages, but we've slightly modified it. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words, words have the potential to kill me. How is that the case? Words that are perhaps indecipherable, words that are too many, words that are insufficient or even the wrong words. And Air Services Australia and the AIP, they're very hot on what we call standard phraseology. Standard phraseology is a vital part of our communication because when we talk on the radio to either air traffic control or to other aircraft, the other party has to know that we know. And therefore, this standard communication is so important. I listen to, in my job, radio frequencies all over Australia. And I can tell you, it is often quite rare to hear a stock standard AIP radio call. Often we hear mishmashes of all different types of calls all mixed in together. Student pilots, and especially foreign student pilots who come to Australia to learn to fly, whose English might be somewhat at a less of a standard than a native Australian-born English speaker, these pilots sit in the classroom and they go through their AIP and when they learn the standard format of phrases, when they go flying, that's what they expect to actually hear. Australians as a rule, we do have behaviours on the radio that do have problems for communication in the aviation environment. Often Australian pilots we speak too quickly, we often use a lot of slang and many times when we communicate on the radio, we start talking maybe half a second before that press to talk button goes down. So we can often clip the start of our transmissions. So we have to just every now and then maybe do a, a readjust and have a think about how we ourselves communicate on the radio. And finally, when we communicate on the radio, think about what we are about to say before we hit the button. The press to talk or the PTT button is a press to talk button. It's actually not a press to think button. Have an idea of what we're about to say, who we are going to address that call to. Is it a specific broadcast or is it a call to a specific individual? Think about our standard phraseology. And when we are in the CTAF environment, one of the things that we need to consider is that before we make the radio call, is the radio call that we're about to make likely to increase people's situational awareness 
or is it likely to actually impact or decrease people's situational awareness? The radio is a very, very powerful tool. And by thinking about what we're about to say and using standard phraseology, we will go a long way to helping the safety of flight, especially in the non-towered aerodrome environment. There are barriers to effective communication. Communicating in the airborne environment has enormous challenges set before it. Let's have a look at what some of these challenges might be. The first thing is the physical conditions. Now I know there aren't many open cockpit aircraft flying around the country, but a lot of aircraft have noisy cockpits. Many of us perhaps haven't had our headsets serviced in years or even our radios looked at. So, so think about the quality of our transmission. High workload environments. If we are in a high workload environment, taxiing at a complex aerodrome in the middle of our takeoff sequence, if we're maneuvering around the circuit or in our landing phase, these are high workload environments. And as a consequence, this can represent a challenge to effective communication if we are just so busy doing other things at the same time. Fatigue. Fatigue's an interesting one. If we are tired, if we are so fatigued, often we exhibit behaviours that can be potentially hazardous. And one of those is the inability to communicate properly. What do I mean by this? Well, let's look at an analogy. You might have worked a 60 hour week. You come home on a Friday night and you're absolutely tired. All you want to do is pour yourself a drink and just sit on the couch and maybe watch Friday night football. If you are so tired, if someone walks in the room and wants an in-depth conversation with you, are you in the mood to actually engage? Most likely not. Fatigue is one of those insidious things that can creep up on us and it affects us in many different ways and it affects individuals differently. But one of the common things we're seeing with fatigue is that it does impact adversely on our ability to be effective communicators. Interruption and distraction. Probably out of all of these factors, this is probably the main one. There are lots of potential interruptions and distractions in the aviation environment. It might be air traffic control, it might be passengers, it might be other things that we're doing in the cockpit. Interruption and distraction has a huge impact on our ability to communicate. Stress. If we're flying and we are in a stressful environment, we might be dealing with unfamiliar airspace, we might be flying an unfamiliar aircraft, or we could potentially be dealing with an emergency. In a stressful situation, we tend to shut down all the periphery and just concentrate on what we're dealing with at that time. Again, that has ramifications for our ability to communicate. And finally, culture. English language, accents, flying in the vicinity with people who English is not their first language, even using colloquialisms or local land features in our communication. We should always, always, always think about what our intended audience is. They might not know where Joe's farm is, for example. We need to use information that everyone has an understanding of. So what are some of the hints and techniques that we can use to improve our technique on the radio? Here are some that I'd like to present to you just to perhaps have a think about. The first is, is the volume correctly turned up and am I on the right frequency? It might seem simple, but I'm sure many of us have been flying when we've been on the wrong frequency or we've been flying with the volume turned down. Volume being turned down is often a trap for instructors where they need to perhaps reduce the distraction of the radio while they're teaching a sequence. And sometimes we get to turn the volume back up to normal levels afterwards. The second thing is think about what information that I'm about to transmit. Is it to a specific party or is it a general broadcast? Is it likely to increase people's situational awareness or will it run the risk of reducing people's situational awareness, especially when there might be a lot of aircraft in the circuit area. And listen out before transmitting to prevent over-transmitting or blocking other calls. A classic case of this is when we're making our inbound call. For example, don't get to a 10 mile from the airport and then flick across and start transmitting straight away. Maybe flick across about 30 seconds beforehand, have a bit of a listen out to find out what the story is, build your situational awareness, then wait for an appropriate break in the transmission and then make your own. Non-ambiguous language. This goes back to our earlier discussion on standard phraseology, because the other party needs to know exactly what's required. So if at all possible, try and avoid using things like slang or local land features. 
try and keep it as much as possible a broader transmission with commonly known features when describing perhaps where you are. And the final one, and this is also a big one too, if you are in the receipt of a transmission that is often spoken very quickly, or there are terms in that transmission that you don't understand, please don't be hesitant to ask for a repeat from either the pilot that made the transmission or the air traffic control unit. When dealing with air traffic control, if they give you, for example, an instruction that you can't comply with, it might be due to things like weather or aircraft equipment or any other host of factors, don't try and fudge your way through. If you can't comply with an instruction from ATC, say that you can't comply, and then ATC will be duty bound to provide you with an alternative. Sure, it might mean that you might have to wait outside controlled airspace, or they, you might be vectored somewhere else, or there might be a few increased track miles or a slight delay, but please don't try and fudge your way through if you can't comply with an ATC instruction. Please tell them, and they will be duty bound to provide you with an alternative. So, Going back to our scenario that we launched our seminar series with today, the pilot of the Foxbat assumed that the lack of radio calls therefore meant a lack of other traffic because the pilot of the Foxbat did see that helicopter depart about five minutes prior to making their own taxi call. And it shouldn't have precluded the pilot of the Foxbat from at least visually acquiring the Dash 8 and the Baron. Most likely the Dash 8 and the Baron would have been all lit up like a Christmas tree with their strobes and landing lights on. So not only is communication in the non-towered airport environment a vital part of our safety, but so is a disciplined lookout as well, using the good old Mark 1 eyeball. So why didn't perhaps the Foxbat see the other traffic in the circuit area? There could be a host of reasons. First of all, Visual scanning technique. Was the pilot just looking out into space or was the pilot actually taking the time and the discipline to do a judicious lookout across the visual scanning horizon? Keep our eyes moving. We're in a dynamic environment, remember. Things rarely stay the same. When we're undertaking a lookout in a CTAF environment, it's very, very important to keep that visual scanning technique up to scratch. It's not my role here to teach you how to visually scan. That's something that you can do with your instructor. But a visual scanning technique when we're flying around or even on the manoeuvring area of an airport is vital. Secondly, environmental conditions can be a problem with achieving a good lookout. Not only things like cloud, but also things like smoke or haze or pollution or rain. Even flying with a dirty windscreen can be difficult. Okay, try landing into the setting sun, landing towards the west late in the afternoon with a dirty windscreen. Very, very difficult to maintain an effective lookout that way. Task overload. We are in a, a busy environment dealing with the aircraft, dealing with other traffic, dealing with issues that come up when we go flying. It's very, very difficult to maintain a good lookout. It's important that we learn that skill as we go flying to not only manage the, those aspects of our flight, but to do so without it compromising our ability to keep our eyes outside the cockpit. Aircraft structure. Many aircraft, for example, have window pillars and other bits and pieces. We have bits and pieces sitting on the combing of the aircraft on the instrument panel that might block, physically block our ability to look out. Therefore, we don't just look out by moving our eyes. Oftentimes we have to look out by craning our head and moving our head. It is important that we, that we use all of these things to maintain a good lookout. There's a term here called empty field myopia. Empty field myopia is essentially what our eye does when there's nothing much to look at. If there's nothing much for our eye to focus on, we might be flying through cloud or at, on a dark night, we might be flying through haze or an inversion, or we might be flying over a large body of water. There might not be a lot for our eye to focus on. If that's the case, the human eye will often have a resting focal length somewhere between three and five feet outside the cockpit window. That's where the eye will rest if we just let it sit there. Hence, a way of beating this empty field myopia is to keep our eyes moving and to also keep our head moving. And finally, the blind spot. What is the blind spot? 
All this is is just a physiological limitation of our eye. It's where our optic nerve hits the back of the retina. At that point in each of our eyes, there are no photoreceptors, there are no rods and cones to provide us with vision. So if we aren't moving our eye, we can have a blind spot literally outside the cockpit where we could potentially have another aircraft sitting there and we might not even know it. It's just a physiological limitation of the eye. So what I'm going to do now is show you a quick video. This video, I understand, was a training flight over southern England, and it gives you an indication as to how easy it is to miss other aircraft and the importance of maintaining a good lookout. So we're flying along in southern England, and have a look at this video. See if you can see that other aircraft. Very, very difficult to see. Very, very difficult to see. But when we zoom in, you can see that that other aircraft was in fact a business jet, almost at the same level, blending into the cloud. So let's play that video once again. This time, see if you can see the business jet approaching from the top left-hand side of the screen, flying along, and you see the aircraft appear out of the top left. Very, very difficult to see. Lots of distractions potentially in that cockpit. It looked to me like it was an instructional flight but we can certainly be surprised when we go flying around, especially the busy airspace around capital cities and busy CTAF airports. So, alerted see and avoid, which essentially is the correct use of our radio combined with a disciplined lookout. If we use not only our eyesight, but also our radio appropriately, we have, according to ATSB research, something like an 800% better chance of spotting other traffic than if we were just using our eyesight alone. We mandate rate VHF radio carriage around the vicinity of CTAF environments in Australia. I don't want to harp too much on the regulation, but it's a good idea just to perhaps review this. Car 166E talks about mandatory VHF radio carriage. We mandate the carriage of VHF radio when we are at or in the vicinity of any certified, registered, or military aerodrome in Australia, or any other aerodrome that we may designate from time to time. That might be something like a fly-in or something similar like that. That's where we mandate the carriage of VHF radio in Australia. We talk a lot about what do we mean by in the vicinity. There are really three pillars to this in the vicinity concept. The first is, we are in airspace that is other than controlled airspace. So essentially we're talking about class G uncontrolled airspace. In the vicinity also means within 10 nautical miles of the aerodrome reference point. Now that doesn't automatically mean that we flick across to the CTAF frequency when we get to 10 miles. If you're flying a fast aircraft, or if you're flying into a destination that you know there's a good chance the circuit might be busy, there's certainly nothing stopping you flicking across to that CTAF frequency at 15 miles or even 20 miles. The Dash 8 that we saw in our scenario earlier most likely flicked across to the Port Macquarie CTAF at 30 miles. What this does, especially if you fly a fast aircraft or you're going into a busy environment, is it provides you with time to build that mental picture. So you don't always have to wait to bang on 10 miles before you go across to the CTAF. Now the third pillar which describes in the vicinity, one concept that often causes some confusion and debate among pilots, is when we are at a height above the aerodrome reference point that either conflicts or has the potential to conflict with other traffic. Now it's not up to us in CASA to tell you what that height is. That's essentially the decision made by the pilot in command, and that can vary depending on circumstances. You might fly across the top of a non-towered airport at 2,000 feet at 3 o'clock in the morning. The chances are that you won't be at a height that might conflict with other traffic. But to fly across the top of that airport at 2,000 feet on a busy Saturday afternoon, again, that's a whole new different ballgame. Be aware also, when we're talking about the height above a non-towered airport, that CTAF airports in Australia, they are no longer cylinders of airspace. There's no defined top to them. Back in many, many years before, we had things like MBZs and things like that, which had a defined top, but not anymore. The height above the aerodrome that you might have the potential to conflict with operations, that's a decision for the pilot in command and the pilot in command only.
please also be aware that there is no silver bullet of regulation that will guarantee 100% risk-free aviation all the time. The CTAF environment is a very dynamic environment. What we have done is we've put out, for example, certain recommended radio calls that will give you the best chance of separating yourself. One last thing before we look at those radio calls that I just want to mention. Please also be aware that Air Services Australia do not monitor CTAF frequencies. Air Services Australia also do not monitor 1267. So the appropriate frequency selection is very important. When you are beyond the vicinity of a non-towered airport, it's important to be maintaining a listening watch on the appropriate frequency, which will be the area frequency. It's only on the area frequency that you will get assistance. If your aircraft cabin fills full of smoke or your windscreen is covered in oil and you have to call a pan or a mayday. If you call a pan or a mayday on 1267, or if you call a pan or mayday or call for assistance on the CTAF frequency, the chances are that no one will hear you. It's the published area frequency that you will get that assistance from air services. So when in the vicinity, people often ask us, what are the mandatory radio calls? The only thing that we mandate in the regulations is that a pilot must make a broadcast whenever they, and they alone, believe that it's reasonably necessary to do so to avoid a collision or the risk of a collision with another aircraft. As far as mandating calls, that's the only thing we mandate. But we do go further than that. What we actually do is we recommend a set of standard calls. And we put that out in our Civil Aviation Advisory publication, CAP 166. So, when in the vicinity of a non-towered aerodrome, what are the recommended calls? We find that the vast, vast majority of pilots make these calls in a fantastic way. They're very judicious, they're very disciplined, but there's always room for improvement. So what are these calls? A taxing call, entering the runway, inbound by 10 nautical miles or earlier. Remember our previous discussion, if you're flying a fast aircraft or you're likely to come into a busy airport, there's nothing wrong with making an inbound call earlier. Joining the circuit basic calls that most people do make. We also recommend that if you are doing something slightly different or something slightly out of the ordinary, for example, a straight in approach, or you might be joining on base leg of the circuit, it's a good idea to let people know that you might be doing something slightly different. So we certainly recommend those types of calls. And finally, if you are just passing the aerodrome in the vicinity of that aerodrome, just make a call on the CTAF to let people know where you are and what you are doing. And finally, a small hint that I like to often give to IFR pilots. If you're an IFR aircraft flying an IFR sortie, especially when there's likely to be VFR aircraft in the vicinity, please don't use IFR based terminology. Think again what we said earlier about your intended audience. The average VFR pilot might not know what a sector entry is. They might not know what an initial approach fix is for a GNSS approach. They don't have to. Think about your intended audience. Give a direction from the airport, a distance and a height and your intentions. Okay, especially for the IFR pilots when there's likely to be VFR aircraft in the vicinity.